all of this was going great until uh, people started getting a little upset about not making enough money. Mm -hmm. And various people kind of all of a sudden, part of it was things like this that would sort of get out there for, you know, everybody to say, George Clinton, man who makes millions pushing P-Funk, you know? So all of a sudden, the band is seeing this, the, hey man, George is making all this money, I am not making shit, you know? So slowly there was a uh, sort of exodus of um, various band members, starting with drummer Jerome Braley, then guitarist and, and mind-blowing singer uh, Glenn Goines, and then it sort of hit critical mass when the original parliaments all left. Uh, Ray, Fuzzy, Calvin, and Grady um, said, hey, you don't need us anymore. You got all, and George was bringing in more and more people all the time. So they quit. Um, he lured Ray back in because Ray's the deep voice on to the roof out. We're going to do the roof out. So had to have him. So, okay, Ray, you know, here. Meanwhile, Grady, Fuzzy, and Calvin kind of started their the original P, or they did a, a, a Funkadelic album that it was, was a Funkadelic, yeah. Yeah. So at any rate, that had gone on. So there was starting to be some turmoil in the band, shall we say. And all of a sudden, uh, there was a lot more uh, powder material floating about. Uh, not that it hadn't floated about before, but now there was a lot of it floating about. And um, guys were getting sort of sloppy and kind of strung out and kind of missing their parts and things like that. And uh, the mothership thing had sort of played itself out. So now George comes out with the motor booty affair. And oh, it was an amazing package on that one. That was by Overton Lloyd, another of the P-Funk artist crew. And that had a, in the album, a cut out of all the characters. And right, you got all this stuff, yeah. So um, th that sort of shifted from the, you know, what do you call it? Mothership to now we're going under the sea. Okay. Yep, all the Overton great, great graphics. And um, in the meantime, and I can't remember which came first, and I'll have to look this up real quickly, whether <coughs> Flashlight came before. Flashlight was out in 77. It came first. Yeah, it came first. So Here's, here's Funkintelliki, Tom. Right. So that's 77, and then um, Aqua Boogie is 78. Yep. So um, – so at any rate, flashlight was still part of the mothership thing, but the flashlight phenomenon came, corresponded with Star Wars. So all of a sudden, and again, I, can't, I have a box full of all these photos, but people were bringing flashlights to the show. And, well, wait a minute, why don't we sell lightsabers? So people started our merch started selling these lightsaber things. And again, this is black audiences on their own bringing or buying these flashlights. And when P-Funk would hit the stage, it was a sea of people waving these things and just like totally on. And when flashlight would hit in the set, again, people would go, fucking insane okay i got i got i got i got to you jack that song, that song when i first heard, heard it, it i got the I got record the day the album came out, out and i it blew my mind i never heard anything like flashlight before it right right it was, it was a landmark re recording yeah and again a lot of people bernie warrell let's talk about him for a minute um bernie was the genius behind flashlight he was playing bass, all the keyboard runs, all the flavor. The only thing he wasn't playing was the drums, 
the sax. So Bernie Worrell was a classically trained child prodigy who gave his first piano recital when he was five years old, played Brahms, Beethoven, could read and write music by the time he was seven years old, went to the New England Conservatory of Music, was classically trained, and is, again, talented as all these people are and were, Bernie was another level of talent. He was beyond great. He was, again, genius. And George's genius, George, quite frankly, not that talented, not a great dancer, not a great singer. You know, what George was, was a great recognizer of talent and giving that talent the ability to create and, and make itself heard. So whether it was Michael Hampton playing guitar, Bernie on keyboards, Bootsy on ba Pedro Bell on art, Overton on art, whoever it was, he allowed them the freedom to create and express themselves with funk as the core to what they were doing. And to get so many people so involved in his vision and a vision they shared. And uh, again, I'm gonna digress for a minute because a lot of that vision was built around consumption of various drugs. And um, LSD, again, was an important component in George's, uh, how do I say it, evolution. Um, he was first turned on to LSD when he was at the Sugar Shack, a club in Boston, and some Harvard students turned him on in, I think it was 1966, which is sort of early. The, Tim Leary was there. This was sort of the early days. L little did you know, you were not far away, right? Exactly. So Bootsy took acid, Jimi Hendrix, George. And to me, acid was sort of an equalizer um, for a lot of these musicians who in earlier days might have felt, uh, how do I say it, segregated against or, uh, you know, beat down or whatever. Acid sort of leveled the playing field because if you took acid, you were having the same experience as the white person who was taking acid. It may not be as suburban -y or as rosy Upper East Side as what they're experiencing, but sort of the beauty and the fulfillment aspects of acid. So a lot of these musicians had, had sort of come out of this acid awakening, if you will, of the late 60s. And George then, with Funkadelic, I mean, Funkadelic, Psychedelic, George played all the rock festivals in and around with D Detroit, with the MC5, Iggy Pop and the Stooges, Ted Nugent, SRC, all the Detroit-based, Bob Seger. He knew all those guys and, you know, hung out and then he would take acid and go into the ghetto and play at this club called the 20 grand and play in front of motown executives guys like norman whitfield who would record the p-funk set and then take riffs and bits out of it and build songs like papa was a rolling stone smiling faces a lot of the norman whitfield songs were directly influenced by seeing George on acid at the 20 Grand Club in Detroit. So acid was a big part of it. Then herb became a big part of it because herb was like, you know, smoking a cigarette compared to taking acid, you know? But it kind of, again, leveled you out, made you mellow, blah, blah, blah. So there was a lot of herb being consumed by a lot of these players. And then unfortunately, cocaine became the dominant drug of choice, both in the industry at large and in P-Funk in particular. And for me personally, even though I'm not gonna lie, I was, you know, I wasn't the little choir boy in the corner saying, oh no, you guys have fun with that. Um, 
it sort of slowly unraveled the P-Funk vibe to the point where it just wasn't working anymore, especially when another thing called free bass reared its ugly head. So that's, to me, when everything sort of started to go downhill, along with um, sort of guys leaving the act, you know, key players leaving. George would bring in guys like Junie Morrison, another genius keyboard arranger guy. Um, yeah, he was... Uh... He was instrumental on that record as well as on um, Motor Booty Affair. Also One Nation too. Yeah, yeah. He's got so, the signatures on that one. Yeah, I'm seeing. So um, Ber um, as great – see, Bernie was getting ready to leave because the Talking Heads were swooping in to steal Bernie away. So there was a little bit of an overlap between Bernie and Junie, but then Bernie left and Junie became – the dominant keyboardist on stage. And and Jerome Braley had left and uh, Tyrone Lampkin became the drummer. And Tyrone had some issues and he left and unbelievable drummer of all time, Dennis Chambers comes on board. So there was this constant flow of great musicians creating great music, but there was chaos everywhere else. George was going through management changes. Record labels were going out of business. He was getting in trouble with various uh, record labels over album art problems. And slowly over the course of, I'm going to say, six to nine months, the air slowly went out of the P-Funk balloon to the point where uh, it had gotten not that much fun anymore. You know, uh, Sony changes had gone down, and a lot of the key players that I was tight with, both on the management side as well as in the band, were leaving. And even though I was tight with the new guys and everything was relatively cool, um, Warner Casablanca Records, we had a custom label deal with them. They went bankrupt. That deal went away. Parliament put out trombipulation, and that was the end of that. I'm sure you got trombipulation right there. One of the greats, last great Parliament record right there. So um, that came out. That was the last thing. And he had a custom label deal with Casablanca. That went away. Um, uh, Funkadelic, meanwhile, had gotten uh, – how do I say it, uh, in some trouble with Warner Brothers Records over the cover art to um, electric. electric spanking. And Pedro Bell had to censor his artwork, which for an artist is like, no, you know. So that was difficult. And uh, they ended up dropping Funkadelic because, yeah, all that green stuff and – it was a lot more graphic, let's put it that way. And well, it, that's a lot more graphic. Yeah, yeah. So Pedro went a little overboard, and what he could get away with at Westbound Records, Warner Brothers wasn't really feeling it. So, so within a course of six months, Casablanca gone. Bye-bye. Warner Brothers record deal gone. Bye-bye. Uncle Jam Records at Columbia Records, gone. Adios. So this cash cow that Georgia created with all these different bands and all this ongoing, never-ending supply of music just sort of frittered away and kind of, that was that. Right. And at the same time, Tom Bootsy was having some issues, right? right? Well, Bootsy's as great a player and, and band leader as Bootsy is and was, Bootsy was never really comfortable. He was comfortable being the front man, but he wasn't comfortable dealing with all the issues of being the front man, from dealing with all the band personalities to dealing with radio, retail, press, uh, record company. Uh, all that stuff became a little overwhelming for Bootsy, and 
First, he con contracted a case of shingles, which is a nervous anxiety disorder, which, you know, your skin breaks out and welts and all of this stuff. And he had to cancel a lot of dates. And then after the, to me, one of his, if not his ultimately best album, Bootsy Player of the Year came out, he was so huge. And again, George would hide out. George, you know, would go up on stage with the wig and the ermines and the, all this stuff. And then go backstage, take the wig off, take this, put on a t-shirt and a jean jacket and walk out and nobody would know it was it's him. Like incognito. Exactly. Whereas Bootsy was Bootsy 24 seven. And he got worn out being Bootsy. He just like, no mas, you know, he just got like enough. And when you're that charismatic and that visual, an entity with that much vibe, it's really hard to sort of disappear, you know, vanish in our sleep, you know, sorry. That was the only time Bootsy could stop being Bo Bootsy was when he was asleep. The rest of the time he was on and people pulling at him. And I've been around him enough to know that he's one of the sweetest, nicest people you'll ever meet in your life. But inherently there's a shyness to him. As, as much charisma as he has, and as outgoing as he can be, he's kind of shy at the same time. So um, having to be the man in charge kind of wore him out a bit. And it culminated with the Player of the Year album, which was hit, 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 him headlining, but then all the pressures of being pushed and pulled in various directions, which had been sort of buffered by George when he was out by George, now he's his own man out on the road and it just wore him out and he he didn't have a nervous breakdown but kind of i mean he just he got sick of being bootsy basically so as all of this was happening i kind of came to the conclusion that as much as i love this music and love these guys this was it was time to step off it was time for me to go do something else and uh, as luck or fate would have it, there was a job opening at A&M Records to be their West Coast publicist. And I had an interview with the head people, Gil Friesen and Jerry Moss and past Muster, and they hired me. So in May of 1970, uh, I left, or no, excuse me, 1970. Yeah, I, wait a minute. 1980. 1980. <laughs> I, I'm having a hard time keeping all these dates straight. 1980, May of 1980, I left to go to A&M and thus closed the P-Funk chapter of my life, or at least so I thought. And to this day, I've worked on maybe a half a dozen P-Funk reissue projects. Did um, you do this one? Um, I, I had something on there, but was that on Funk Essentials? That one I, I did a lot on, yes. uh, liner notes as well as some photos on that one. And um, just, just as I've been involved in a lot of different types of music, P-Funk still resonates with me and the, the greater audience of funksters out there, funketeers, more than any other music I've ever been involved in. And, uh, you know, this past summer I was at a, a free event in downtown LA, 40th anniversary celebration of the landing of the mothership. Five to 6,000 people just getting down, just totally digging it. And the band up there was, former some former p funk players as well as some top players here in la uh ricky vincent the sort of p funk scholar knowledge guy put it put the sort of context of it together it was all hits from 1977 and i heard songs i hadn't heard in almost 40 years you know funk and telekey and and things like that 
And, and it's in the Smithsonian, too. So that's the picture from the Smithsonian. Yeah, yeah. So there it is. So at any rate, um, obviously, you're a lover of the funk. And I hope uh, I was able to answer or tell enough stories to make it interesting enough. But do you have any specific things that you'd like to know or ask? Or uh, Wow. Well, you know, I could go on forever. And I really appreciate you putting in the time to uh, give that history. It's unbelievable. You lived, you know, so many guys dream fantasies, Tom. I mean, gosh. Incredible. Yeah. Um, man. So uh, did, did you get to spend any time when they were in the studio? And if so, what are a couple of memories from that? Um, I spent a fair amount of time when they were recording the Clones album because they were recording just here in Hollywood. And I had just joined in. So I would hang out in the studio. And it was before they were going out with the Mothership tour. So they had maybe a three-week time frame to pretty much get the album done. George had done a lot of the basic tracks, but now everybody was coming in to put on their parts. So people were basically living in the studio. I mean, it was booked 24 seven. And, you know, again, there was a lot of uh, substance to keep everybody awake and going, but um, guys would crash out on the couch and there was no shower in the studio per se. So, you know, funk is its own reward, but it, it got a little smelly in there after a while. But I was in for, you know, I saw them doing vocals on, you know, uh, things like um, Bop Gun. Uh, Children, very, of Children of Production. Children of Production, things like that. And I'd just be hanging out, you know, mainly in the, in the sound, you know, mixing area while they'd be doing all their vocals. Uh, subsequently, I'd go to Detroit with different um, writers and go to United Sound in Detroit. And that's where George had done a lot of the Westbound records, so he was familiar with the place. And uh, he had a guy named Ron Dunbar, who was an Invictus producer. He originally done uh, Clarence Carter, Patches, Free to Paint, Band of Gold, a uh, number of Detroit R&B hits. And he would do some of the, again, Parlette, uh, Sweatband, um, things like that. And I will say, I, I'll, I'll never forget the first time I heard Flashlight. There you go. Yeah. And again, Ron Stozo Edwards' uh, artwork there. Um, but... The first time I heard Flashlight was I was in Detroit and I wasn't in the studio, but George, he had this bag full of cassettes. There must have been 80 to 100 cassettes in there. None of them marked. No markings of any kind on any cassette. George would reach into the bag, shuffle them around. Oh, man, here's what I want to play. Boom. And he put it on the car stereo or whatever. First time I heard Flashlight was driving around Detroit with George and Archie Ivy, and he put on flashlight. And again, my head, you know, it, it's amazing I have a skull left. I mean, I was like, oh my God, this is gonna be such a hit. So sure enough, you know, that was, you know, <laughs> amazing. And I was there pre-release to hear it, you know. Wow. The other guy who I have yet to mention who was another ultra talented genius that George had the uh, ability to recognize and bring into the P-Funk fold was Roger Troutman and Zap. And I spent a lot of time in Dayton, Ohio with Roger. I was very close with him and uh, got to see him at work. And oh my, again, I mean, this guy was genius. I mean. Everybody, the big thing back then was hand clap sound and getting the most snap on your clap. And he had a hand clap sound that was just like, how in the name of God did you do that? Mm -hmm. And, you know, between his talk box and, I mean, he could play 
drums, bass, keyboard, harmonica, saxophone, guitar, and and then the rest of the Zap band, his family, and this and that, they were all incredible. So we spent a lot of time in, in, in Dayton as well. So um, the, I didn't see Bootsy record so much. Uh, the, my only studio experience with Bootsy was he had to edit down singles that were going to come for the Bootsy Player of the Year album, like uh, uh, Bootzilla. And Bootzilla was originally like eight minutes long. And first he had to knock it down to maybe four and a half to five minutes for the album, and then three and a half to four minutes for the single. He was going out of his mind. He was like, how can I cut this out? How can I? Oh, man. You know, he was like hating on the whole editing process. But we got it done, and that went on to be a number one single for him. And the Player of the Year album, I think, was a number one R&B album. So, um, like I said, I feel blessed. I was, I can't say I was the right guy. I was just through serendipity or luck or fate or however you want to put it. I was at the right place at the right time with the right band at, at a time where they created a musical movement that still lives on to this day. So I feel very fortunate, very proud. And I still love that music. I love the people who create it. And there's a community among funk people. There's, it's almost like hippies back in the 60s. If you saw somebody with long hair, you go, oh, that guy's dead. Now, if you see somebody who's sporting the funk on some level, or you know was a part of that world, it's like instant communication, instant understanding, instant on the one yeah. band. You know? Let me ask. Let me ask this. Does he ever believe that after being around for sort of the demise, that in 2017 and 2018 George will still be doing what he's doing? Um, I, I frankly, I mean, I'll be really super honest here. I love George to death. Um, I'm thrilled that he's still doing what he's doing. I'm still I'm thrilled that he's alive and that he's as lucid and cogent and intelligent now as he was when I first met him 40 years ago. But this man has been from hell and back. You know, he's seen he's lived four or five different lifetimes and seen more stuff than the average bear ever sees. Um, I think part of it, though, is necessity is the mother of invention. And as we were talking earlier, um, the actually, I was talking with someone else about this. The only money is on the road these days um, between streaming services and people aren't buying downloads anymore. They're just streaming. And those, I don't care whether it's Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, Pandora, whatever it is, they're not paying enough for the content they're delivering. So that income has gone from, let's just say back in the day, live performance and, and record sales were even or around this area. Now it's live performance up here, music sales down here. There's such a huge gap. And you know, unfortunately, this is George has to do this, whether he wants to or not. Mm -hmm. Now he's again a loyal person. He's brought in his family. They they sort of put on this show, which I've seen recently, that is different from what I saw back in the day. But for today's generation, it's compelling, funky maybe a little more hip hop than I might like, right. but for an 18 to 25, 28 year old kid, it's right in their sweet stuff spot. So. Well, now the audience is primarily white too. I'd say 80 to 90% white and the 10 to 20% who aren't are people my age who are coming out because they remember it from when they were younger and they want to, re-experience that vibe you know but
but uh, you're right. It's mainly white kids. What I found, and it's it's crazy being me sometimes because in the most unlikely settings, I, I I'm in the vanilla suburbs. I, I'm look. I'm I'm the first to admit it. I had my four year fling into the funk. But now I'm like a middle-aged white guy living in sort of a suburbia area of L.A. All of my friends have kids, and all of their kids come up to me, and they go, excuse me, Mr. Vickers, yes. Are you the same Tom Vickers who was on all those Parliament Funkadelic records? And they go, well, yeah, that was me. And they are mind-blown. They're like... And what I found is, as a rite of passage, it used to be sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Now it's sex, drugs, and P-Funk. Hmm. And for a lot of these kids, P-Funk is as vibrant today to them as it was to us when it first was created. Yeah, so, yeah. That's a beautiful, that's a beautiful thing. thing. I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, frankly, you know, I didn't even know, I never knew all these years that you were white, not that it mattered. But right. I just had no idea, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, I think I told you I met this. Uh, I was at a, one of these P-Funk art shows, and uh, I was with Stozo, Ron Edwards, and he introduced me to this young white guy. And he, said, he goes, what's your name again? And I go, Tom Vickers. He does the whole not worthy on his knees, you know? And I go, come on, man, what's up? He says, you made funk safe for white people. And <laughs> I, okay, you know, I guess that'll work, you know. But uh, if I, I'll, t I'll tell you right now that at that 78 Forum Bootsy show, I was the other white guy in the forum. Yeah, <laughs> but wasn't, I mean, to, wasn't that an amazing show? Oh. It was, when, the, when the confetti and balloons came down, he said players can be playing for days. Yeah, wow. yeah. No, I mean, it was mind-blowing. And He had a cartoon. Yeah, that would open the show. Yeah. But see, after that iteration of Bootsy, he did those big, you know, arena shows. And then by the end of that, he was done. He was like, can I crawl under a rock and stop being Bootsy now? You know? And the next album was This Boot is Made for Funkin'. Didn't really have a hit on it. Didn't really, eh. And just like P-Funk, who went from selling out the Forum and Bootsy selling out the Forum, now it was going, you know, to a 2,000-seater or a 5,000-seater. Just, just by the time this came out in 79, I was already seeing them at the Santa Monica Civic, which was right. like five or 6,000. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the thing. I mean – their their touring income was going down as well as their recording income. And yeah, they were still getting a lot of record play and getting ASCAP and BMI performance money, but they weren't getting that, you know, half a million dollar advance from the record label or whatever. So um, again, as Bootsy uh, just and P-Funk, it all, like I said, the air slowly went out of the balloon over the course of maybe six to nine months. Were, were you kind of torn when you had to finally? I wasn't, I wasn't. I mean, again, the hard part was I went to a and and I'm not dissing any of these acts because anybody who's had a hit record, you know how hard that is to achieve. So I'm not one of those haters who like, Oh, I hate Chuck Mangione, you know. Mm -hmm. I hate the Carpenters. No, I know. I respect them. They had hits. That's a hard thing to achieve. But all of a sudden, I went from working with a band where I knew every member of the band. I was down deep, hard with everybody to going to see Chuck Mangione where I don't know anybody. And I'm just kind of, well, it's music and I have to promote it, but... I'm not really connected to it, you know? So that, that took some getting used to. And it was also hard getting used to the culture of light record labels. Because again, just as P-Funk was a free form entity on stage, it was a free form entity as a business. And 
there was a hierarchy of, you know, this guy, this guy, this guy. But for the most part, it wasn't like a record label, you know? So uh, it took some getting used to dealing with the politics and, and the personalities that one had to deal with um, at, at record labels, you know? So that was, that's a whole nother conversation that we could do maybe yeah. some other time. But yeah, yeah, we'll have to do that. Yeah. Uh, I know you were at Capitol some years later. Did you cross over with George at all there, or was it after George? It was after George, but I sort of um, crossed over a little bit because I was only at A&M for a brief period, and I signed a band called Kiddo, mm -hmm. which had Mike Hampton in it, sort of, sort of, not, not fully, but... Um, they were an offshoot of a band called the Sterling Silver Starship Band that was led by this guy named Donnie Sterling. And um, I signed them to A&M and sort of worked with a friend of mine as the manager. And again, because of our P-Funk connection, the manager had been P-Funk's booking agent. Um, we were able to do some opening date slots for Parliament Funkadelic. And this is when Atomic Dog was hitting, when George was hitting with Atomic Dog. So I'm doing an interview thing. I'll be out in two minutes. So um, I did see and saw, you know, that show and was, you know, around for some of that. But That was actually a pretty good show. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, look, George... He's one of those guys you can never count out, you know. Um, he, he can come up with something out of nowhere and turn it into something. Right now I saw him, you know, two months ago, and he's got this new tune, tune out he's working called I'm Going to Make You Sick. Yeah. And it's on his website, and you know. I've seen it on Facebook a couple times. And it's – you know, it's prime George. I mean, it's like he hasn't lost anything, you know? So, um, again, I, I feel so privileged that people like you are interested. I meet these young kids, and they're interested, and I'm actually sort of working on a memoir of this era of my life called Almost Funky, <laughs> and about 20,000 words into it, and I went over a lot of the stuff with you here and now, but the memoir kind of digs a little deeper and gets into a lot of other, you know, parts of the puzzle and issues and situations that went like down. Almost famous, of course. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, well, well I, 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 I appreciate you being so generous with your time. I don't want to keep any longer, but I do want you to promise, and I'll promise you that we will connect again to talk about so much other great stuff you've done. I'm a big ZZ Top guy also, so I mean, I wanna talk about a lot of that other stuff. Yeah, well, I've got, you know, stories for days, like you said at the beginning when you were setting up this interview. Um, I've been in a lot, a lot of different situations with a lot of different styles of music. You know, it's, it sometimes staggers me how many people I've been in the room with and also was, I'm mean, able to work with. I mean, I was a little late today because I had uh, lunch with a woman named Lauren Christie, who I signed when I was a record executive at Mercury. And um, she was Amer uh, American Music Awards Adult Contemporary nominee for Artist of the Year in like 1992. She went on to become a songwriter producer and did Avril Lavigne's Complicated and Skater Boy. And mm -hmm. since then, she's had hits with Christina Aguilera and Britney and 10 other, you know, top acts. So that's going to warm your heart. Yeah. Yeah. So the key for me is uh, I've always felt that music is a sacred thing. And if you protect it, it will protect you. And that's how I've lived my life. I protect the people who create it, and I protect the music itself. And oh, so far, so good. We're all grateful to you for doing that, Tom. And 
uh, I'm going to close it out, but I want you to just stand by for a minute, okay? Okay, great. Okay. So with that, I'm going to wrap up this edition of Truth and Rhythm. A huge thanks to my special guest, Mr. Tom Vickers, a key player behind P-Funk's Mothership era, who has spent more than 40 years helping get wonderful music into the lives of millions of people. Thank you again so much, Tom, for your time and your experiences and your stories. Also, sincere thank you to listeners and viewers. Be sure to look out for upcoming Truth and Rhythm episodes and catch up with previous installments at FunkinStuff.net, on YouTube, iTunes, and other leading providers. We want to hear from you. Drop me an email at scottg at FunkinStuff.net. Let me know what you like, what you don't like, who you'd like to see on the show. And so, as always, until next time, on behalf of Tom Vickers, here's Tom one last time. This is Scott, Dr. GX Goldfine, saying keep on vibrating to the rhythm of the one.